I'm the first Navy bloke in 40 years to go to, to do a, a lag in a military prison. I still suffer pretty bad post-traumatic stress and that. Chains around me, wet waist and me hands in full uniform, chains around me legs. After the blood laws, bro, I see the big change in the club and I, I didn't really like it. You weren't allowed to ride together, no colours, all that kind of stuff. It was dead set hard getting out of the club. And we don't get to help people enough. In this world, that's what we're going to look towards, helping each other. Young soldier of God. Steady march. Yo, it's your boy Dave here, and this is the TFS podcast, The Fresh Start. How about you introduce yourself, brother, and where you're from? Yeah, g'day, Dave. Um, my name's Dave. I'm from Newcastle, little town, suburb, coastal town called Stockton. Yeah, I, uh, 55 years old, going on 66 now. <laughs> from New South Wales, huh? How's the weather? Yeah. So are, 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 you, are you there currently, or...? No, no, I'm, I'm up uh, in Cape York at the moment, up in Cape York, beautiful Cape York. Oh, beautiful, man. Well, um, I wish I could say I could pop in and visit you, but um, with the way things are standing with the whole deportee thing, I have to wait for you to come to New Zealand, but who knows, one day. I don't think they'll let me in there either, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true that, true that. All right, well, this is the brother Dave here, so it's an absolute pleasure to have you on, my bro. So the brother Dave here is, um, you know, doing living his best life at the moment over there in Queensland and, uh, you know, doing the right things. And um, But obviously this man has a story of redemption. That's why he's on the show. And, um, you know, brother, you've, you know, you've done quite a bit, you know, you've lived, uh, you've lived a few different lives and things, you know, so this man has, um, well, he started off uh, sort of in the military um well no sorry the navy so he served in the navy and uh you know he ended up in a military prison and as we will go into there's a reason why those places you don't hear about them much you know what goes on inside those places so the brother dave he'll be able to give us a bit of insight into that and then also you know from there he uh, actually lived the club life and actually climbed the ranks to the top there and was president for a bit there so he knows all about the laws in Queensland in relation to bikey association and those Vlad laws which are pretty tough and it'll actually be interesting to hear about those laws because they're actually implementing them in New Zealand at the moment so there's a, definitely going to be a shift here in the scene and um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to hear about that stuff but in the end Dave was able to transcend obviously and like I said, now he's living his best life and he wants to share his testimony of what he's gone through and hopefully lift another brother up or lift another sister up out of that those dark spots and those dark situations, which is what we're all about here on the show. We're all about bringing the dark to light. So um, anyway, again, Brother David, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's been a tough old trot, let me tell you. Military jail was a... It was hectic, bro. It was uh, something. I've been locked up, but not, not never done big lags, you know, but I've been in a lot of lockups and uh, all around Australia and know the routines. And I never joined the Navy until I was 26, so I'd been around and uh, I'd been on the verge of club life, you know, hanging around and doing stuff. And Well, b before you go into that, brother, so, so where did you grow up, bro? How was it uh, growing up in in Newcastle? Oh, bro, I lived in a little town called Stockton and we were like a little country town right on the beach, isolated from Newcastle, but we were a three-minute ferry ride, you know what I mean? But we had to cross bridges and that to get there. And it was unreal surfing, skateboarding. We were, we were the crew that I hung around with, we were, yeah, we were, we were pretty, you know, we were, we were before the, you know, not saying that we were anything like the Bra Boys, no, nothing like but we were localism. We were local, all about localism in our beach, you know what I mean? And, and we ruled the beach and, you know, we were pretty violent in the surf and a lot of fights with uh, people coming to surf our break and a lot of beach parties, a lot of fights, a lot of pubs. And then, you know, we were kind of the outcasts. We got the drugs and, you know, I played footy as well, loved me footy and, uh, I was pretty. I played for New South Wales country team when I was younger, and you know scored over two hundred points in a couple of seasons in a row. And but back then it was violent. If, you know, I was brought up in the seventies and eighties playing football, and I played front row, so you had to be violent. You know, and and 
like that was I never had a dad. You know, I was brought up by my mum, my granny, single parent, no no license, nothing like that. You know, and never had a car. So my mum, she put it into me that I had to be the protector of the family and take and the football. I love watching. My favourite team was Western Suburbs, the most violent team in the Sydney competition. <laughs> and they were at their height of being violent. And, uh, you know, so I copied him, that, those, and and that went into the surfing too, you know, and our little crew. And then the drinking and the drugs come in, the old school speed and uh, heroin come in. At a, and we all had a chop at that, don't worry about that. And then, you know, the crime and the fight was getting bad. And I met a girl and whatnot. So I moved, I started, I thought, you know, and plus I thought, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, me balls are jocked. I thought, you know, that I've been fighting every weekend for God knows how long, and I wanted to get away from that. But it, I went into work in the nightclubs and the pubs in Early Beach and Hamilton Island and the Cairns and all that for a few years and mixing with on the fringe and, you know, and on the fringe of the clubs and good mates. Didn't want to join, you know, but I, I was into motocross bikes and, freestyle and that was just coming out and but I was always on the fringe you know and doing drugs and you know collecting debts and all that kind of caper and uh then my missus got pregnant and I thought I'm going to jail for a long time or, or this is going to end bad the kid's gonna you know it's gonna end bad so I thought I'll join the military and I'd, I had to be kiss pistol license concealable pistol license at the time and I'm doing a lot of competition shooting. So I was very familiar with pistols and firearms and all that and always been around them. And it took me, I had a criminal record. So it took me like eight days to get into the military. They kept knocking me back and I hadn't been in for, been schooled for like, you know, 11, 12 years. And, but they said to me, keep coming back, you know, every three months. So I thought, fuck it, right. So I kept going back and bullshit and I just bullshit. I've got bung eyes, you know, eye test. They go, I'm going, yeah, A, B, C, D, you know, change eyes. And they never picked it up. They never once picked it up. Even when I got in, they never picked it up. And they gave me glasses. I've got new glasses and got, you know. But anyway, that's another story. But me, me criminal record kept coming up. And um, you know, I said, oh, this is discrimination. You know, this is bullshit, you know. And they said, well, send us your court documents. By this stage, I'd been tried about seven times to get in. They kept asking me back and your English isn't bad, your arithmetic isn't too good, go and get a tutor. And I was thought, I've got to do it. And once I set my mind to something, I set my mind to it, you know? And um, <laughs> bullshit me way in. And I finally got in there. So you, you've gone from, you know, like you've said, you know, you've been around the club scene you know you're hanging around you know sort of dodgy individuals you Boy. know you're, you're getting into the drugs you know so you're fully entrenched so for you to make that decision to enter the military I mean first of all good on you you know even though I mean I guess it didn't work out in the end but for you to have that go I guess you know to to want to wanna go and do that I, sh I, I guess it sort of shows you, you know your strength at the time I guess even though you must have been on the drugs and all of that I guess it shows that um you still had that inner um you know go or well, what's the first thing that happened while once you were uh enlisted and I'm on the bus and I'm flying down and I see a bloke you know he looked a bit older and we're at the airport and he says you want to get on the beers mate and I said oh, fucking I'm hung over yes so we're on the beers and we get down and I'm, I'm like I said I'm older I'm expecting you know, the full metal jacket, you know. And we fly down, get on the bus, and it's like a two-hour bus ride to the base at the bottom of Victoria. And no, no one said nothing. I'm thinking, what? Well, that's a letdown. I was, you know, expecting someone in my face. Come on, no, no, no. No, nothing like that at all. And I'm thinking, oh, what about that? And anyway, I ended up thumping a bloke in survival at sea and I, you know, got in trouble for that and got me leave taken off me and all that. So, so you've gone into the military from there and you're sort of, um, man, you've got a lot of uh, luck, I guess you could say, and, um, you know, a lot of those situations. So yeah, yeah. Uh, how long were you up into, uh, how long were you, um, had you been in the Navy before that incident happened? 
Uh, well, I was probably on me probably eighteen months, and I was on deployment. And uh, how was that? How was how did what, what did you get up to in that eighteen months? Oh, I, I got posted to do a shore post, you know, and, and that's another incident. I had another incident there too. I was I was posted to HMAS Watson, which is you know you know Sydney. It's pretty. Vaucluse and all that, you know, the, the Rose Bay and all that to get to Watson's Bay. It's all the high suburbs, you know. And I'm only the bottom rank of the Navy and I'm probably <laughs> six months into my first shore posting and I'm driving to work, Sydney traffic, peak hour, and I'm in my Navy uniform. And there's a bloke next to me and I'm going, oh, can I get in next to you, mate? You know, peak hour traffic in the morning. And he's going, give me the finger. Anyway... We pull up the next set of lights. He jumps out. I jump out. And bang, 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 bang. Lights. This is in Vaucluse. I went to, and the first person I seen when I got on base was the Navy police. And he goes, come here, look at you. What are you? And I told him, he said, we better go down to the cop station and see what's going on. Went down to the cop station. First thing the copper says to me, what did you use to hit him? And I said, oh, you know, I'd been around. I said, I'm not saying anything more I'm to the police cops. And turned out to be an off-duty police officer coming back from night shift. And he was pissed that he had his head. I could smell the grog on him. And I got charged, got charged. And uh, oh, it, was, it was an undercover cop. Yeah. But oh, he'd been coming no, home night shift. No. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It was an off duty cop. Coming home, but he was off duty. He was undercover. And coming he was home. drunk too. And he was drunk. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, that didn't matter. New, and South, I Wales, New South Wales finest. <laughs> so that was the first incident. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, so, you, so you so so you stayed in the navy after that. Yeah, 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 bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so they didn't kick you out. They didn't kick you out for that. Nah, I was getting deployed onto a ship. So, and plus, I got a barrister, you know, because I know the laws and all. You know, I've been yeah. through the system, yeah. you know, and I had a bit of money behind me. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. So I got a oh, barrister. Wow. So, you got, so you got. So you got through the breaks there. So. Yeah, yeah I was going to jail. Crazy. I was going to jail, but because I joined the Navy, got a missus, kids, the barrister told the book, you know, the story that they tell. Happened how how was it, though? How was it, man? Like, um, just the aspect of, you know, um, obviously you've got your history and, you know, you've got your ways about you, but how, how was it actually, you know, serving your country and, and that aspect of it? 100%. And my mates took bets before I joined. They said, you're not going to last two minutes with your temper in the way you are. You got... So they took bets. And the longest bet, I think, was nine weeks. You know, oh, and so I you beat up... that. So you smashed that. Yeah, I've done years. I've done years. I done Even when I went to prison, I'd still done years after that and got promoted. And... But years later, they said, you know, I think it's time for you to go, mate. You know, <laughs> we don't need people. They were changing the Navy too, you know. They were... It was, you know, no more crossing the line ceremonies. It was too violent. But when you, when you, sea life is good. I loved it, you know. And it was an all bloke crew when I first got in there. And good bunch of, you know, hard, hard boys, you know. And we took respect in what we do. And they build you up. They build you up to say you're the best, you know what I mean? You, and you, they make you confident. And coming from the streets where I was confident in some things, and but I'd shy away from everything else. Yeah. You know what the drug yeah. scene's like. You're, you're the man around the drugs, but away from the drugs, talking to normal, normal people. You fucking back in your shell, one, you know. But the military kind of it was like a family. I never had, you know, like a footy in that, you know, and being around the boys, and you know, and it was it was good. And then you, when you your first trip, when you go past the equator, they call it the crossing the line ceremony. So all the newbies get on there, and you get a bit of a beat, and you used to get a bit of a beat and then a bit of a rough up, and you know, and but they stopped all that because they said it was too violent and people were shying away. I fucking loved it. So that's the cross of the line ceremony. And, and like I said, the Navy was changing. And uh, the incident happened in Menando and they, um, yeah, mate, my life changed. Like I'd never seen anything like that before in my life, mate. And, you know, you go, you go in front of the captain of the ship and you've got legal representation, which usually is a mate that's a couple of ranks higher than you. No legalities at all. No... You know, the captain of the ship, what, he's not a judge, he's not a barrister, he's not, you know, my mate that was representing me, he's certainly not a barrister. <laughs> and he said, Well, so this is, uh, this is after the incident. Well, so what actually happened, bro? Um, we're in a little, you know, big drinking back there. The culture was drinking, and I wasn't a drinker, so I was, you know, I could drink, but, you know, that was my game. 
and there was a party in there drinking and carrying on, and, you know, and one of the seniors, yeah, hey, what do you do? And I said, oh, fuck off, I'll drink where I want, you know. Remember, I'm older, and this is off the ship, so when you're drunk and an officer says something to me that's like, I'm in a bar p- pissing at 2 o'clock in the morning in the truck, and I go, good day, mate, and he said, you'll call me, sir. Off. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, we're pissing bar, you can get, you know what I mean? That was my... And the, he was a chief. He wasn't an officer, and I told him to get f- and He didn't like it, and we had a bit of a row, and that was an incident on the drink. You know, I'd been drinking, so that made it a hell of a lot worse. Back on board the ship. So what happened at the the sentencing? Or <clears throat> yeah, well, they they said you got a custodial sentence, and I thought, yeah, well, well, so who who sentenced you though? The, that's what I was getting at before. The, the captain, who's got no legal. Yeah, no, but you see, this is the thing. Yeah, this is the thing. So I don't know much about this, but. Isn't it that, yeah, like with that whole maritime law and, you know, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. isn't it out on sea and stuff in the ship, the the yeah, captain well, is, the, the captain can yeah. sentence people, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's in charge here and you're the military. So when you go to the prison, there's three stages that you go to. You back chat, well, you're not allowed to talk there. But when you, you when you get there, if you, if you arc up, you know, I'll say, get fucked or whatever, you go to a con- like a, a cell that's confined itself. You get nothing. And if you arc up from, and it's a padded cell, and if you arc up from that, you know, straight jacket, and if you resist that, you're five years in a mental asylum. Five years. No ifs, buts, or maybes. You're five years in a mental home. What? You know? Five yeah. years? Five years. And that's a big... You know, and what they do to you when you're in there, like I said, no talking. You only get to talk, talk three times a day, unless you're requesting across the red lines to get some. You know, it's 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 the biggest mine. I'll get I'll get to the prison. I'll, I'll tell you about when I got out the court and getting extradited back from Singapore and chains and all that for a second because yeah. I'm kind of story yep. in that. So yeah, do the sentence, and then they—I had to do what they call watches. So we, we went to see, and I had to do watches until we get to Singapore. So I'm up for like 24 hours. They put me in a room so I couldn't sleep, and I'm in chains and all that. And they give me a steak with a spoon, a steak. So you know, I'm making with me. But when I get off, I've got a—I'm in uh, ch- chains around me, wet waist and me hands in full uniform, chains around me legs. They chuck me in the dog box, take me back into HMAS Penguin, which is North Shore of Sydney, keep me in, the, in a cell there for about five hours and then drive me out to Holsworthy um, Army Base, which is, that's where, in the, right in the middle of that, that's where the um, Defence Force Military Prison is. And uh, and that's the gates of hell. <laughs> Once you go out there, that's like, uh, you know, you, and I, you know, like I said, I, by this time I'm 27, been around a bit, been locked up, been flogged by coppers, you know, been beat, blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't prepared for that, man. I, I, you know, no way. I was preparing myself mentally, trying to think, but it was, you get out of the back of the dog box and they strip you down and you do the run and then they take everything off you, make shame of you, you know, point and carrying on and there's women that, you know, staff laughing at you. There's only like, seven staff in there like about 10 cells but i never seen anyone in, in other cells than i seen with two other blokes get in there army young fellas and, the, and i was in the prison most of the time by myself the whole prison and there's 10 cells the two uh the padded cell the conf- confinement cell and everywhere you go there's uh red lines there's red lines and you've got to carry pack World War II pack and all World War II falling apart and you've got to mend it all the time. And you get four dressing sections a day and four cell inspections a day and they can turn into 16 cell inspections and, and uh, dress inspections. If you want to go to the toilet, it might be 20 metres away and you've got to cross red lines. It might take you four hours because you, you've got to jog everywhere with your pack. And the, the guards, they're called staff. And your servicemen under sentence by this time, SUS servicemen under sentence. And when you get to the red line, you go, you jogging, you know, you double time. You know, SUS Martin requests permission to cross the red line. Permission denied. You might be standing there jogging for an hour until they give you permission. You've got to keep, you know, ask again. But you're only allowed to ask twice. So you've got to be timed well. 
you got to get leave time, and they might say in between, you know, right out, you can go. But that happens over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, when you get in the toilets, you know, there's a big toilets and amenities block and that, and you got to clean them with toothpaste and fold the toilet paper the right way. And you can't talk, and they give you these things to read, and it's like it's like the Marines, you know, I'm a Marine, you know, like that, but it's a, it's it's you're a prisoner, you know, and like I said, I got mates that are still in now that have done 30 years, and they say to me, no, we've never heard of anyone like you, man, you know, never ever, and yeah, Veterans Affairs don't want to touch me. I'm, I'm putting they laughed at me, and you know, my time in that life back in Australia and even in prison and stuff like that, you do actually see a lot of former soldiers becoming um, bikies. You do see it, um, or not, it, or, or, or not even that, but just actually joining, you know, that life. Uh, how, do, how do I put it? They're never going to be the same people again, even though what they've done in, in the war. And that's the thing that people don't understand. Go and get next to back to to Australia in your in your, in your, in your country's uniform for something that I thought was pretty piss weak, and getting treated the way I was. Hmm. Oh well done, I did me shit and I cop it on the chin, but. I've seen a lot of people do worse and so what and, and killing people and blah, blah, blah and, and not even get looked at, wow. you know? Wow. You know, get looked at and and not on the piss. Man, I could tell you 400, I've seen people bashed to smithereens and hospitalised and, you know, and because of the drug and, and they're supposed to be mates on board and nothing, it all gets covered up. But I understand that's the way it goes. I was too... No, I was targeted. My time. It wasn't my yeah. time, <laughs> yeah. you know. And, yeah. and, and I, I admit I was aggressive, and, and, and but I was good at my job. I was good at my job, real good at my job, you know. And, uh, yeah, and I had a lot of support, and I got, I got a lot of, even to this day, a lot of references. People talk, you know. I make, like I said, mates that have been in for 30 years ago, people still talk about it. That was great, good camaraderie. You know, places, like I said, I'd never get, would have had the chance to go there. Never, ever. A lot of things that I've done, playing with millions, you know, jumping out of helicopters and, you know, gun, you know, my forte was weapons and, and explosives. <laughs> oh, so you've that. jumped out of like helicopters and stuff? We used to fast rope, yeah, fast rope out of helicopters on the, on, you know, on the ships and that, seeing, yeah, do wow. boarding parties, stuff like that. Yeah, 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 done all that because I knew my time was up and, and the, the kids were didn't want me away anymore. You know, the, the, the missus, you know, we were together 17 years and, and we were like three, four years into our relationship when I joined. And uh, she, um, she she never touched drugs. You know, I was I was on it and she was always good. She'd just drink and, and you know, on a diary, <clears throat> never touched drugs. It wouldn't even smoke. And then the, she's, and then the ice is about and bang, she's. So, you know, my world turned upside down. It was going good, but I thought, you know, new houses and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, I'm getting out, you know, back to the old town, which was a big mistake. And she'd already got on the, by that stage. And I thought, no, this isn't for me. I've got to, I'm going backwards. After I got out, I thought I was going to be in a position where I'd be, you know, doing all right in life. But no, nah, man, no. Nah. And I hurt me back and all that kind of stuff. And it just went to shit. And then I went and worked and I thought, no, I'll go and work in the mines, you know, get me head out, you know. And, and that's when I joined the, got into the club life and, you know, and it was good because, you know, what club life's about, you can't use needles and that. And I thought, fuck it, this is my, you know, the consequences are too much. If, if, I, if I go back into that life, this is, it's going to be another life, yeah. And I'm going to be around, you know, stuff like that, sweet as. And, but I got a reputation for not doing that and not being staunch against it and stamping it out around the areas that we were in and got a lot of respect for that one, especially when I got to the top. And, and um, you know, I hated it. I liked all the rest of that as <laughs> hmm. And still, but, you know, and I hated, I hated the ice and the, you know, I hated it. I hated what, what it does to people and what it did to my family. Well, so how was the sort of club life, bro? Like, um, especially after having served in the military and things like that, like how how did that sort of happen for you? Uh, just working with a few, I, I, by that stage, I, you know, I, I, I was always into bikes and I, 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 I had a bike, I had a Harley. 
well, that stage. And, you know, a few of the boys around town and that, you know, and work and that, because so, I love doing burnouts. <laughs> I'd ride it like a two-stroke. And <laughs> I had a fat boy, brand new fat boy, and I'd ride it like a two-stroke. I think it was, you know, and anyway, it's, it's so, yeah, got, you know, they said come and have a few parking drinks, and I told them I'd been around, didn't want to join and all that, and been around for a long time and partying with them and all that. And, and So how did your family sort of see it when you joined? Oh, my mum loved it. She always, me, me mum and granny would sit up and watch Wayne Gardner and Mick do and ride the 500 cc's at two o'clock in the morning, you know. <laughs> when In the 80s, bro, my mum and granny loved it, you know. And when I joined the club and she loved me bikes and all that, and I, 82 year old, me granny was, and I was still doubling around on me bikes. Me mum was 80 when she died and I was still picking her up at the at the dementia ward at the old people's home in full colours, the nurses had gone, yeah, I did photo shoots with the nurses and my mum. I love the club that I was with dearly and, you know, I love them. Got out good, you know, but um, it uh, after the Vlad Laws, bro, I seen a big change in the club and I, I didn't really like it. You know. oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so what? 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 So how long had you been in the club by the time the Vlad Laws? Um, uh, about about uh, just done a full four years, five years, five years, I'd say. Um, and like I said, we were doing great. We had, you know, we just bought our own clubhouse. We had, you know, tattoo shops. We had, uh, you know, we had a lot of business, which was great. And we're all doing good. We're all, and that's the thing too. My chapter. <laughs> I was the only one that had a criminal record, you know, like, and I couldn't believe that when I joined. I went, well, yeah, you ain't got a criminal record, you know. Like, all right. But they were, you know, old school hard men and new, they were good thinkers. And, um, yeah, well, I've, I've spoken about the, the, this with, in uh, previous episodes with other uh, boys that were in the club scene and all of that, and they all trip out as well because a lot of people think that um, the, major- the majority of club members um, have criminal records and things <laughs> like this, but it's only a few. It's only <laughs> actually a, a few. Like I remember when I was in prison in Victoria, you know, when you know, when you see on the news, there'll be, um, you know, this club's been busted or this club's been busted and then you'll see them come through the system. And when yeah. you meet and when you meet them, a lot of the time, they're all first timers, you know, and, and some of them are older as well. So how long before you had your own chapter in? Six years, six years, you know, I was up inside your arms and then all that kind of business. And uh, yeah, it was probably when I got the president, I think it was, Boy, just uh, maybe a year and a half after the Vlad Laws come in, and we were getting hard, we were getting a hit hard, you know. Like I said, the boys that I were with, they were, they were old school riders. We had to, our, our our chapter. We had to ride a thousand k's. None of this bullshit. Fifty. We had to ride a thousand k's. We had to do. Excuse me, because we were isolated. You know, Western Queensland, far north Western Queensland. So we, any run that we'd have to go to, it would take us a week to get there to the run and then a couple of days of run, then a week to get home most of the time, you know? Well. Especially when we went around Australia. We went around Australia, mate. And, you know, we were going, I was going, you know, I'd done 13,000 Ks in 22 days. And, oh. I, and I, had days, I had days off on the piss and, and you know, I'm partying and, and days off. But we, we were riding hard. That's what I mean. We, we you know... We'd get to the city chapters and they'd go, no way, we're not riding with you. You just, you just go, you know. <laughs> they want to pull over 150 Ks and we go, that's not on. You know, <laughs> it's not on. It's not on. So, yeah. yeah. And riding the outback, mate, that's a different kettle of fish. You know, it's like uh, you ride in a pack at night time with the kangaroos and all that. It's dangerous, man. And first time I did it, was city boy going, I sh- himself and the, the president at the time who was a hard old staunch good good old school um he said if you want to ride and he, he said i know you can ride you know i said mate there's fucking wildlife and everywhere i said no i'm not used to this i'm a city boy so you want to ride with us you got to do it so 140 k's we sat on 140 k's mate you know drive two hours in the middle of no- nowhere desert and there was big reds everywhere I and mean, i'm freaking mate i'm like when i got to the pub we were staying at mate i was so exhausted and mentally drained they're all you know charging down. I was like, no, that's it i'm going to bed that was but i got used to it you know what i mean that first time woo, 
you know, yeah, yeah, that, uh, that worked me. It worked me. Oh, but, um, oh. yeah, they, they, no, no criminal records and had businesses and all that. But when the Vlad clause come in, mate, and they're locking us up for six months with no charges and stuff like that and, and not telling no one and keeping us in isolation and all that and breaking up families, bro, on purpose and killing dogs, you know, all our dogs, because, you know, we all had dogs. <clears throat> And we had a big yard and big outdoor pools and big outdoor bar and all that. Beautiful, beautiful. Absolutely. We just had it renovated and all that. So they all be our dogs would go there. So our dogs got out, they'd run around there, you know. If they got out of our yard, they'd go around there. So when the blood laws come in overnight, the next day miners come come out underground, they go home, their dog's gone. Well, oh, it'll be around the clubhouse. Went around the clubhouse, mate, went come out of the door. I got three of my mates got fucking six months jail because picking their dogs up because you know, because they went on the property of it. Those dogs, they just put into, you know, they ripped the houses to pieces. They just threw them in the house and closed the door, no air conditioning enough, and locked the owners up, you know, and the dogs went berserk in the house. These are pig hunting dogs, you know, and bull terriers, and, you know, they've wrecked the house and the inside died. So the house is smashed. Old mate's lost his job. His house is wrecked. His dog's dead in the house. He's lost his missus, and he's got no job because no one knew where he was. Because of the blood loss. He gets home to find his, you know, six. We we're getting locked up left, right, and centre and losing everything and breaking families up. And, you know, and when the clubhouse closed, we had old people come up going, we felt so safe with you in our street now that, you know, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? And it just went, mate, it ruined lives. It ruined people that oh. had no connection to clubs that, uh, yeah, so the Vlad laws were some laws that they put in place in uh, Queensland. And yeah. um, I mean, it's interesting for us here in New Zealand because uh, the government that's just um, come into play now, National, is going to be implementing these laws. You know, a lot of people are, um, you know, talking here in New Zealand about how it's going to look. And so obviously the, this took place in, in Queensland uh, a few years back. So, bro, like, can you explain what happened and the, what what the Vlad laws were and all of this? Yeah, it wasn't even, it was a scuffle in service paradise. And I did, you know, that the government, you know, between two clubs, it, it was nothing. But they blew it all up, you know, and, and um, they just, they, but the Vlad laws and his, um, affect two types of people, pedophiles and one percent outlaw motorcycle clubs. Those that, who the people, and it says in the Vlad laws, pedophiles and one percent OMC club members. I couldn't talk to people in the street, across the road from the street. I couldn't talk, if I was in a, a drive through bottle shop and another bloke's in a bar in that pub and another bloke's out eating uh, dinner at the bistro, Three of us are all gone. We're gone. We're straight to jail. You know what I mean? And we didn't even know each other are there. There's a famous case called the Yandina Five. There was five five family members in different parts of the pub that didn't even know that they were there. And they'd done a lot of time, you know, and had to fight and use a lot of money. We, we spent, our club alone spent nearly $3 million trying to fight the Vlad Laws to no effect, to nothing, you know. And they're using the Vlad Laws now on these protesters now. That's what they're going to do. They take the rights off you. You can't associate. You can't phone to call. You know, but you can't be in the same house with someone. You know, you know and you can't be in the same neighbourhood as this bloke. And you can't talk to this bloke on Facebook. You can't talk to that bloke on Instagram. If you do it six months jail without it, you know, bang, they can't yeah. get you. Oh, you know, what they, about like even tattoos and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, tattoos. You know, twelve thousand dollars for a belt buckle and a one percent ring. It's how much it cost me. But when it come in, bang, yeah, yeah. And like I said, overnight we were criminals. We, had, we, we, we lost businesses overnight. Legitimate businesses that have been good to the community for a long time and uh, lost them overnight. Um, weren't allowed to own businesses, uh, nothing. Uh, if you're a, a member, um, you're not allowed to own no business. You're not allowed to have your name on no businesses, not allowed to have no businesses whatsoever. Um, you got to justify your income. They can take your look at your um, banking records, a drop of a hat. Um, look at your um, what you buy, what you sell. Yeah, it's the, the control I have is one hundred percent. It's like they had my dog in diapers, wanting to see what it's shot for a week. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's like that. It's you know, 
Well, if they kept your dog for a week. Yeah, they knew it was, they knew my kids because I'd fly home to see my kids in Newcastle, and I knew that was the only way they could stop. And they pulled me off flights. They did all kinds of stuff, locked me up for you know birthdays over Christmas, just to fuck you with your head. And then they knew that my kids weren't there, so they couldn't get through my family. But when my sons had come up, dude, they'd pull them over just to pull them over, driving around. Where's your dad? Where's your dad? Where's your dad? You go to a nightclub, straight in the nightclub. Where's your dad? Where you know? And they fucking they didn't want nothing to do with the club. They loved it, but they you know they. They're not into that scene, you know. Tore a lot of families apart, like you said, you know, because um, unfortunately, a lot of people who were just family members or associates, they got caught up in the mix, and um, you know, it was it was pretty ruthless, like you said, just locking people up just for hanging together, or you know, I mean, so t-shirts. Like, well, well, so up, up to this point, so they'll put the Vlad laws in place, and what sort of happened, bro? So you ended up um becoming president, yeah, sort of yeah during this time. Yeah, well, it was a, like I said, they were, you weren't allowed to ride together. It's no colours, all that kind of stuff. So, like I said, it, the landscape was changing. Um, no big runs anymore. Only a couple of states we could have the runs in. So I took over, you know, just before it all kind of started. I think no, just after, just yeah, just after. And it was it was a shamozzle, mate. It was. Um, you were it was fighting to keep alive, just to fighting to keep your job, fighting to keep you know food on the table, fighting to keep out of being locked up for some bullshit reason that's going to cost you fifteen grand and keep you locked up for, and 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 nothing nothing come out of it, you know nothing will come out of it. Like I said, they had me for attempted murder charge. They couldn't even tell me who who I'd murdered, but they locked me dog up, and the rest of the boys locked them up. They re- the whole house was covered in fingerprints and DNA samples cut out of everything. And, but they couldn't tell me barristers who, who we'd killed up, who'd we, but we chopped it up and fed them to me dog. You know, they dug me old yard up. And this is just one of, I could tell you a million things like, you know, and, and the rest of the boys could too. You know? But, um, and then it's an embarrassment, in, in, you know what I mean? You, you, all your friends that, you know, your straighty friends that, you, you know, they know you're not a bad person, but all of a sudden, they, you know, there's 60 forensic police going through your house every second day, you know, and they know, they, well, he must be up to something bad. He must be up to something bad, you know. And, and then it would come to the, me, me employers and, the, you know, you, you can't work in the mines anymore, you know, because they were pulling me up from underground saying my motorbike was leaking petrol and I didn't even ride my motorbike to work that day. And they just to pull me up underground to get me to lock me up and take me, you know, and no one knows where you are, what you're doing, strip searching my girlfriend, and, you know, and stuff like that. And it just making her life hell and everyone around us hell. And, and if they could prove that we were doing something wrong, fair enough. You know what I mean? But no, it was never anything like that. Never any. So, and it's still like that in Queensland at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, bro, they've just had big raids and all that all through and, you know, we're eyes to win and, you know, that's what I mean. And that's what brings the the, 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 the wannabes in, the ones that don't want to ride, you know what I mean? They they think that's kind of cool, you know what I mean? To be, I, I've never seen so many wannabes and, and, you know, blokes that can't even ride coming into clubs after the Vlad Laws and that. I think it might have been just to recruit and some stuff like that where, Standards might have dropped in certain clubs and other clubs. I don't know, but uh, it just seemed this. You know, you had to live up the standards and you had to live up the rules and God, You know what I mean? And I, I was military mind, and that's why military blokes kind of join the organisations like One Percent World because you got to live by a set of rules, and we're used to that. You know, and, and we want to live by a set of rules. I mean, once you take the set of rules away from veterans, and we go a bit wobbly, you know. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, oh, so yeah. so during so during that time when the Vlad law, Vlad laws got put in place, there was an influx. So a lot of clubs started recruiting during that time. Was it? A lot of old school blokes thought this is. This, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not putting up with this anymore. So a lot of, including me in the end, I, it got to because my mum was going downhill too, and I didn't want to be locked up. I, I promised my mum I'd never be locked up if she passed away. Mum said to me, "You're a bad bastard," but I'm. I'm not, you know, I don't visit you in jail and you better be, when I'm going downhill, you better not be in jail. I want to see you, you know what I mean? And so it was a promise. I wasn't, there was no way I was going to get locked up for some bullshit reason and then mum pass away. No way. No way. I would have, I, that would have been the end for me, you know. So I mean, it, was, I it was because of the Vlad laws you ended up leaving, was it? 
and mum's health was going down really bad. And the, the, what I'd seen the club become, the bike world was changing. That's what I'm probably getting, getting at. The bike world, like the military, I suppose. The, the military is changing and, and, and it made the bike, the Vlad laws make the bike, the bike life change. The 1% world change. It did. I don't care what anyone says. It, did. it didn't do its job to put, get us out of the picture, but it, it changed, you know. You couldn't ride with your mates. You couldn't hang around your mates. You couldn't wear your colours. You couldn't drink together. You, you know, there was no more riding in a pack. So the Vlad laws are uh, definitely changed the the bikey scene, but not in the way they thought thought it would. You know, it didn't, it, it didn't stop it. It just sort of changed the face of it, I guess. Yeah, and like I said, it was just a different different world, and and that's what was getting me. We couldn't ride. And, and we so had, everyone that wore a patch got arrested, got, got taken to jail. Even the noms, even the the um the the sons, you know, associates. Yeah, man, they all hundred percent. So Every, what happened? They, and they locked the women up. They tried locking the women up too. Don't worry about that. But how did that whole process go when you sort of I uh, wanted to walk away from the club life, bro? Like I said, mum was getting yeah. bad, and and I they understood my biggest worry, you know, with the Vlad laws, you know, because that's the way they knew they could get me, and yeah, and then when the time was time to come, it was just getting too hectic, bro. Like I like I said, I knew I was going to go and do a big lag, and the rest of the boys, they were, by that time we'd lost numbers big time. We'd lost a bit of up, but upheaval because of the pressure that had been put on everyone you know i'm not this not you know talking down any of the boys you know there's a few boys that they the t time was right for them to get out too you know what i mean so a, a lot of the older boys you know and um so yeah and i thought to myself well, i don't want the young gangsters and the you know the blokes that aren't into riding. and some of them got bikes and they're wearing you know other clubs and that were wearing cutoffs with patches and I didn't want to be involved in anything like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. like I said, man, you know, here in New Zealand, the laws are changing, bro. So all of that stuff that you're talking about in Queensland, this is what they're implementing here in New yeah. Zealand now. So that's why I said, man, it's sort of good to get your insights. So they really did crack down. Eh? I mean, I was in Aussie yeah. when they when they, when they were doing all of that. And I remember we used to see on the news, you know, I mean, that a lot of bikies were leaving, bro. You know, I mean, I remember yeah. he left Queensland, you know, and came down to Victoria. Yeah. And... You know, I know other clubs that lost half their numbers of the national members, you know, and that's a, that's that's hard to recover, you know, and, and, and the quality that they're losing aren't getting replaced by quality people. They're getting, you know, the standards are dropping. It's not the, you know... You're not getting the same quality, one percent bikey. Not a wannabe bikey. Not a gangster. A bikey. Not a biker like they call them in the states. You know, we're Aussie bikies. So there was a danger yeah. aspect. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Hundred percent. Especially you know when we went to other you know we were we were isolated. So there are a lot of places that we could be picked off quite easy if you get me drift. So what happened, bro? When you le when you left that uh, world behind, man. So how how was oh. that transition for you, man? Bro, at the start, you know, oh man, it was itchy because I was getting offers and that, you know. And I tell you, it was um, uh, it was hard, man. It's um, yeah, it's a big change. It's a big change. It's it's, you know, not having that support group around you too. You know, it's um. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it, I felt again like when I got out of the military and that, you know, a bit lost and all that, you know. And, and I, yeah, I was thinking going back then, but, it, you know, I kept pulling a little voice in my head saying, you, you want to do a lag, you want to do a lag. No, I don't want to do a lag. There's things in this world I want to do. You know, the camaraderie, the mates, and being able to go for a ride, and you know, with mates and, yeah, it, it was it was sad. It was sad. It took me a while to get my head around it. Yeah, it was, but it was hard. It was it was dead set hard getting out of the club and, and you know, even just go for a ride. You, you're looking over your shoulder, you know, because you're so used to the coppers pulling you over and they did. And, you know, they, they walloped me for a long time until I ended up getting the and getting the barrister and, you know, and, yeah, they still wanted to lock me up after I got out of the club and all that. Tried to, tried to hit me with the Vlad laws and all that, and yeah, and you got to prove it. And I said, 
I'm a veteran, man. I'm a veteran. You know, I'm not proving nothing to you. You proved to me that I'm still in the club. You proved to, but it's not like that. It's not like that. But that's the attitude that I took. And after a while, like they still hound me, and it's been a few years now. But not, you know, half a dozen years, maybe four years. So how has the last few years been, man? Since uh, sort of in your new in your win. When you sort of left that life behind, life is good now. You know, like I said, I've got a lot happening. I'm in a beautiful place. You know, it, I'm 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 fittest that I've been for a long time. Um, you're still loving riding. I mean, I, like I told you before, I'm in the rainforest where I live. You know, it's uh, it's it's spectacular. It's absolutely spectacular. The best part, best place I've ever been to. I've got a beautiful home, and, and yeah, I'm, yeah, it's. It's exciting time in my life, and I didn't think it'd be like that when I'm this old. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's all just starting up. The journey's just beginning. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always, I always like challenges. You know, I always like being out of my comfort zone. Um, I suppose it's the military, and I don't know. But I, I, I like, I like challenges. Always do like challenges. You ask anyone. Yeah. No, me but too, yeah, brother. Me too. That's where I shine best. Yeah. I find. I'm that's hearing what, I'm hearing that, that, uh, That's why me, man, I always um, save everything till last minute because that's where I shine, you know, when I'm under that pressure. <laughs> bro, hey, like I was saying before, I'm moving house. It's last minute, bro. No planning involved. It's just bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, that's the way to live life, mate. <laughs> yeah. I've learned, you know, it's one step at a time, bro. You know, I, I still suffer pretty bad post-traumatic stress and that from... You know, military and whatever, but um, that's life too. But I, I you know, I, I, I put my hand up. I get counselling. My mental health is my main thing at the moment. You know, you know that's it's, it used to be everyone else before, but now it's my mental health. You know, it's that's a big part of my life, making sure I'm happy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly, man. I mean, that should yeah. be a big. That should be the big part of all of our lives, isn't it, brother? You know, making sure yeah. that we're all right in here before we start searching for the things out there. You know, I mean, like you, Dave. Looking at yeah. you, bro, I definitely commend you on your journey, brother. You've gone through a lot of things in your life, so so to see you um out now and smiling and looking like life's just beginning. You know, like that's what it's all about, you know, it's of all the people watching and stuff like that, you know, like you can be caught up in these spaces and, but it's never too late. It's never, bro. And I believe, I've always believed, no matter how bad I've been in my life or not, I've always had old mate or who I call <laughs> my family, my family. Yeah. I don't call him my mate. Uh, I don't call him boy. You, you, yeah, you I know, get you. You get me, you get me. Yeah. Look, man, we're sort of coming to the end here, bro, and it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, sharing your story here. You know, all we do here is just share our stories because I've just seen the power of it, you know, what it does, just opening up and sharing um your story, you know, it's just, um, it changes lives, you know, and it's free. It doesn't cost money, you know? It doesn't cost money. And, you know, what like, you're helping people like me and the other people that you do, you know, we, we don't get a chance to tell our our story or we don't think anyone wants to hear our story most of the time, but you'll, you know, you'll be I, surprised. I brother. <laughs> yeah. But I appreciate it. You know what I mean? It, 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 it helps. It heals me is, you know, we don't get, to, we don't get to help people enough. And, mm. and, uh, in this world, that's what we've got to look towards helping each other. You know, thank you very much, Dave. Very much. Appreciate it, brother. All right. Cheers. Good on you, mate. Thanks again.